you could please take your seats. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Mariculture Conference of Alaska. My name is Missy Good and I'm the Mariculture Specialist with Alaska Sea Grid. And joining me here is Eric Wyatt. He's the owner operator of Blue Star Oyster Company, president of the Alaska Mariculture Alliance Board of Directors and Oceans Alaska board member. Um, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of Akwan on Linke Ani, also known as Juno and Douglas. Linket peoples have been stewards of these lands since time immemorial, and we are grateful for their stewardship and incredible care of the land. Today, we gather together as an opportunity for farmers, nursery and hatchery operators, professionals within the industry, agencies, and researchers uh, to present on and discuss a broad range of topics related to the latest mariculture innovations, science, and activities in Alaska. The conference supports continued development of shellfish and seaweed production in Alaska by looking at accomplishments and opportunities, including areas of research, education, and industry growth, and provide space for exchange and discussion. While the industry is currently at a nascent stage, we've been provided with opportunities for growth and development. Many of these opportunities are thanks to the support of the State of Alaska Administration. And in recognition of that, I would like for all of us to put our hands together to welcome Governor Mike Dunleavy, who has graciously dedicated his time to provide opening remarks. Well, good morning, everybody. It's exciting to be here. I was looking at the, um, the agenda, and um, I almost feel like uh, canceling the rest of my day and just stay here with you guys. Um, Anyone here from Maine? Um, hmm, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we have a lot to learn from each other, and obviously um, Alaska has a tremendous opportunity. Anyone from Oregon here? Ah, there you go. Okay, pretty good, pretty good. So it's my goal, and folks from Maine and Oregon don't take this personally, but it's my goal to make Alaska the mariculture capital of the world. Um, <laughs> In any event, um, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're, we're all sharing information and we're learning from each other. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity, I think, for a lot of folks in a lot of locales. It's another way to feed people. Um, it's another way to get food into restaurants as well. And um, where we're headed, I think, is going to be a place where you're well positioned to help uh, a, a lot of folks and a lot of entities. Um, you know, I'm gonna be excited about hearing uh, about your, your SPAT capabilities. We were just talking about that. I know right now we import it because of our, our situation with our cold water here, but any and all, everything associated with mariculture, everything from SPAT to oysters to different types of shellfish that you feel are, uh, are appropriate for the water here, and also the kelp. And I just want to talk briefly about the kelp, uh, the kelp situation. So obviously, you, some of you have heard about our initiatives on carbon. And um, you know, carbon is a reality. It's a, it's a commodity now to be monetized. And there's some tremendous opportunity in carbon for, for Alaska, for Alaska mariculture uh, uh, owners um, and proprietors, as well as those that uh, want to grow kelp to sequester carbon. It's a new approach. It's a new process. They're still getting some of the uh, bugs worked out of that. But with our extensive coastline, it could be tremendous. And our contribution to that, uh, that initiative, I think, is, um, is, um, is huge. Also kelp to feed people, obviously, is, is what a lot of kelp is being grown here in Alaska right now. But it's also kelp for, for fertilizer, for animal feed, uh, uh, poultry feed. So it's, it's, to me, I'm excited about what you're doing because we're trying to uh, make Alaska as food secure as possible. Grow as much stuff here in Alaska. As I mentioned to you guys at one time, during the pandemic, it was March of 2020 when I was sitting at my desk in Anchorage, kind of the height of the beginning of the pandemic. And we had gotten wind that um, uh, the governor of the state of Washington was contemplating uh, shutting down the port of Anchorage. At that time, we had demand destruction in the airlines. People were not flying, didn't want to get on the plane. The Canadians were shutting down the overland routes. And to get word that there's a possibility that the port of Seattle would shut down, this paints a whole new picture and brings clarity to a whole lot of things we have to fix in Alaska. And one of that was food. So the idea that if we can grow as much food here in Alaska, uh, it is something that I support 100%. And 
And you'll see that in our initiatives, our policies, our budgets. Uh, many of you know that we have a 140,000 acre um, agriculture project up in Yanana that we're looking at in expanding and getting that in the hands of farmers. My goal <clears throat> before I die, hopefully that won't be soon, is um, to, to, to see Alaska as an agricultural giant. I was on a conference about a month and a half ago with a very large land company whose job is to broker farmland across this country with investors. And uh, it was out of Des Moines, Iowa. I was doing a Zoom. Nonetheless, they were talking about land prices in Iowa, which is corn country, black earth country, $15,000, $16,000, $17,000 an acre for farming. In Alaska, we have tremendous opportunities because we have almost unlimited land compared to some of these other states. Our fresh water is tremendous here. Um, our pristine ground, land and water is a tremendous, I think, a tremendous branding opportunity for your business as well. So I just want to let you know that um, uh, I'm thrilled to death that this business has taken off. I'm thrilled to death that you're part of it. I see this as the beginning of a, a huge endeavor, and uh, my administration is going to do everything we possibly can to encourage you, to support you, and uh, to wish you nothing but the best, because your success, in the end, is our success. So good luck today. Looks like an exciting agenda. And um, I am uh, looking forward to hearing more about our ever-growing mariculture industry here in the state of Alaska. So thank you very much. Good luck today. Uh, thank you for those words and the tremendous support you have shown for Alaska and the mariculture industry. And now I would like to hand it over to Eric, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker and facilitate our first session. Good morning. So welcome. You know, one of the interesting things for me doing this is I have no idea what I'm going to say. So, <laughs> um, I, it's exciting for me. I kind of personally had a little vision of having the, our two different organizations, the Growers Association, Mariculture Alliance, and Sea Grant University come together in a week so we can have, I see old time farmers here, you know, brand new people, policy makers, government, you know, our, we call them regulators, and all in one room and getting a chance to interact with each other, I think that makes us stronger. So, thanks for coming and Thanks to Melissa and Sea Grant for doing a great job organizing this event. wasn't wasn't easy. <laughs> so, Dana, come on. Um, years ago, I a couple, several different times I've reached out to um, Dana, and he's you know from I'll say Sea Grant in Maine. Um, I think a known expert in my mind on a couple more uh, technical issues and then I've heard from other folks from Maine you know how connected he is as I find out now he's got his own farm too you know to boots on the deck and let's say research policy what's going on and he's gonna have some great examples for us and I'll let you introduce yourself much better thanks for coming Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I've never done a keynote uh, sort of thing before, so I'm a little nervous. Um, uh, and I will muddle through as best I can. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Eric, it's so nice to meet you after all this time. Um, thanks also to Missy and the whole Alaska Sea Grant uh, team, and particularly to Weatherly and Greg Bates for reaching out in this opportunity to begin with. Um, it's already been worth it, at least for me, spending an hour talking with growers and people who I haven't met yet or hadn't met before or hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, it made a pretty grueling travel day yesterday worth it right off the bat. Uh, so yeah, my name's Dana Morse. I'm an extension agent for the Maine Sea Grant Program and University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Um, I started in 1998, and when I started, I looked around. There was a bunch of basically old white guys in the job, and now I'm one of those guys. And I, I think it's because uh, they all loved their work, and I have loved my job, every second of it, right from the get-go. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, and I'm going to try to 
give a sense of why Maine seems to have a little bit of a buzz about it. Um, and I'm not sure I can do it completely justice because I feel like some of those things are real intangibles and they're really hard to put into context. But I'll do my best. Um, and Missy, I'll look at you for a high sign or like poke me in the side of the head for time. Or are you the timekeeper? Yeah. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll dive right into it. The first few s slides are kind of like set up stuff. I want to uh, give some context and then hopefully some functional concrete things about why Maine seems to have a buzz. Um, so the cover shot is a New York Times story. There have been plenty of people who like to come up to Maine to do stories. I don't know why. Um, and this is one of them. Um, but it just kind of goes to the point of people are kind of taking notice. Um, so here's Maine, um, top right of the lower 48. Um, and these are some of the things that we're famous for, I, th I think. Uh, we've got big mountains, we've got lobsters, we've got uh, a good coastline. We have mooses, we have trout and salmon, we've got a lot of black flies. It's like Alaska's little brother or little sister, right? Like I got thinking about, well, our mountains are much smaller and our meese are much smaller, and the only thing that we have that's different maybe is we have a really big boot and we have moxie. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and so those are maybe some separating things, but that's where we are. Um, the state uh, has about 5,000 miles of coastline. It's highly diverse from one end to the other. It goes from south and west to north and east. So you go down east. Um, and there are about 10,000 commercial fishermen of different types. A lot of challenges with um, access to stocks, access to licenses, climate change, all kinds of things. There's a lot of gentrification happening, happening along the coast. And there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and maybe some of those things are, are familiar here as well. So a little quick overview. They, they always say, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So I'm at least going to do two of those things here. Um, I want to cover a little bit of this stuff. I'm not going to dive too far into it. But here's the, whoops, here's the proposition. Maine seems to be getting noticed. So why is that? That, that I feel, is like my job here. Um, so there are some things that are inbuilt, which um, uh, some might translate to here, some won't. Um, and those are these items up here. We've got a long coastline. We have a working waterfront tradition. There is 400 years worth of boat building knowledge there, for example, and understanding the environment. Um, something that is different than here, we have a, an inbuilt proximity to the marketplace. And the, the saying goes, we're 24 hours truck ride to um, Chicago and east and Atlanta and north. So that's a real benefit for people who have understood the main brand and want to grab a hold of some main uh, seafood. We have environmental suitability for many species. Um, and then there's this other list here, and you can read it for yourself, but the ones I'm going to touch on mostly are the uh, regulatory process where I think it all kind of starts. Um, the extension, education, outreach, and training, the culture of inclusion and information sharing, and the bit about sound business fundamentals to help make businesses work. Um, let's see here. Which way do I point it? Okay, so just a quick shot of Maine, and I put this up here, again, to show some of the geographic diversity. Uh, Gulf of Maine is basically an enclosed sea. Gulf uh, Georges Bank to the south and east of it um, kind of gathers Labrador current water, which is cold and salty, and we've got a lot of freshwater runoff. And so the oceanography of a, of a highly um, sort of a fjorded coast is pretty complex. Uh, which way do I point this thing? That way? Okay. Um, and I would be remiss. I just added this slide or two this morning because, hi, James. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, the, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the, the modern aquaculture main story starts in about the 1970s, but it goes well beyond that. The first aquaculture lease protections for, are from about 1859. And it's from people like... Ed Myers and Dr. Herbert Haidu, who were mentors and teachers of our early modern um, aquaculturists. And they're, even though they didn't like each other, like they really didn't like each other, their messages were kind of the same. Herb was saying, use science as a platform. You need to understand and use science. 
But at the same time, science doesn't teach you everything. Go out there and, dirty, and get dirty, cold, wet, and bloody. That's how you learn. Ed was coming at it from the other way. He was an entrepreneur. He said, you need to have a business. You need to think about market and uh, customers and process and profitability. And science is important, too. And these guys worked about 400 yards from one another, where I work now at the Darling Center. Um, and I wrote a poem about them, which I won't bore you with, but the dynamic between those two guys was just great. And I'll, I'm looking at Joth Davis now. Maybe you and or your brother know some of those stories, but there's a book right there. Anyways, they set a lot of the foundation, and many of our early entrepreneurs who became iconic in themselves studied with uh, these scientists and business people. And the thing that I'll say here is that, and my background is in commercial fishing, shellfish aquaculture, and particularly in now seaweed aquaculture, these businesses and these industries emerged like this with science. New growers either came from science or they understood the value of science and its limitations. So this industry, shellfish and seaweed, emerged very closely with science's support um, in helping to answer questions. Now, my background's in commercial fishing gear design, uh, and that put me into conservation engineering and that kind of stuff. And the commercial fishing industry in New Hampshire is 400 years old, and it did not go like this. It, the commercial fishing industry uh, went its own way, and science kind of came in side, sideways later on, and of course, there are many, many uh, disputes and arguments between science and industry. Aquaculture is always going to have some of those disputes, but it's in a much better position because, in my view, shellfish and seaweed evolved right hand in hand with using science as a tool. So, okay. Um, and there were a bunch of stories like this that came out from the, from the Darling Center. Here's 1970. And by the way, for those of you who know Bill Mook, has anybody ever heard of Bill Mook? Yeah? Okay, a fair bunch of you. I go to, I've got one of these stories, and he's, he's got the... He's got the collar up like this, and he's all, he's got the mustache, and he's all 1980. And it was from like 1982 or something like that. There are some great things in the archive there. Anyway, um, so uh, there's a little bit of context and a little bit of background. I'll say that uh, we grow a fairly sizable number of species currently. Um, shellfish, seaweed, uh, eels, uh, finfish, and there's a suite of other species that are in development. Um, and here are some rough statistics about what's going on in the state. And I would say much of this activity has happened in the last 10 years or so for some reasons that I'll get into later. Um, and this is one of the principal drivers. Is anybody scared by this graph? <laughs> yeah. This graph is scary because we've got 5,000 lobstermen. And when I say lobstermen, I mean men and women and that's how they like to be referred to there, and their families. There are entire communities that are dependent still on lobster. And when you have entire communities dependent on one source of revenue and you have climate change and market and increasing bait and fuel, it becomes economically very nerve-wracking. And so uh, for us, um, a lot of the work that we do is driven by wanting to diversify and add opportunity. Because you can't just go and get a ground fish permit. You can't just, there's no shrimp fishery anymore. So opportunities are limited. And now to dive into brass tacks, one of the, the essential things why I think Maine is, has been uh, noticed, and this goes back a number of years, is that the regulatory process is pretty good. Um, and there are, there are people who will find fault with it, and it is not perfect, but by and large, it uh, balances conservation of the natural resources and the public, uh, public responsibilities for those publicly held resources with opportunities for business and, and development and that sort of thing. Uh, and we have a suite of tools to do that. Um, first of all, it's pretty one-stop shopping. And I'm looking around, is it one-stop shopping here in Alaska? Yes or no? Anybody care to make a gesture? It's pretty good? OK. So this has been helpful. When you file with Department of Marine Resources, they automatically send, their, send that application to Army Corps of Engineers, DEP, EPA, all that kind of stuff. So that's good. The fees are relatively decent. You've got to have some skin in the game. If it was a $5 application fee, then you might not get serious operators. And we want serious operators to take care of our public resources and to do well in business. 
um, leases are transferable. People are coming to Maine specifically because leases are transferable. And not everybody is happy about transferability, but that's one of the reasons why people are saying, oh man, I want to start a business. Um, I'm thinking about what to do with my children, um, and if they want to get into it, where can I go? They come to Maine. Um, and there are a lot of people coming to Maine to become aquaculturists. We have a, a suite of regulatory permissions. Um, the limited purpose aquaculture, the LPA thing is a license. It runs year to year, costs you 50 bucks. It's for only 400 square feet. So that's like baby bear. Um, you have to get in the water if you're really gonna learn. People like me can teach and tell you things, but until you get cold and bloody and wet and dirty and sad, you're not gonna learn, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so you have to get into the water as an essential part of entrepreneurial development. The experimental lease costs you 150 bucks to apply. It is good for up to four acres for only three years. So here's like mama bear. This is to help nurture you along as a, as a business development um, step where you can begin to grow to scale. And this is where you begin to understand your risk. And I think this is really important. Risk management, understanding where to put your time and effort and your money, trying to explain to your financiers, bank or investors that you've got a handle on your books. This is where you really start to, to learn, although it happens here too. And then standard lease is up to 100 acres, uh, excuse me, 100 acres for up to 20 years. A single individual can hold up to 1,000 acres. Nobody in Maine has 1,000 acres. Um, so these stepping stones allow a person who may have some experience or no experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in. I'm going to take this site and I'm going to learn on this site. I gather experience. I gather confidence. I gather data and a track record. And now um, uh, producers can begin to see their path forward. And DMR has a bunch of stuff on their webpage. And this is really important because currently there are very long wait times to process a lease. We're talking two or three years. And I don't know how that compares to here. But um, what it means is that really, if you're going to get cold, wet, and dirty and start to learn, your avenue is a limited purpose aquaculture license. And this is a problem currently because DMR has been understaffed with this incoming wave of applicants. They've been underwater. They've been doing their best. Uh, and the staff is competent and well-liked and well-regarded. It's not about um, staff not being competent at their work. It's about um, the thoroughness of the process and the, the number of applications coming in. Um, we do have pretty strong communication between staff and industry, which is really a strength. The public health division, which now just recently has the aquaculture division under it, um, is also very well regarded. The information that you get out of public health is clear and it is firm. You might not like what you're hearing, but at least you know what they're saying and you can make a decision and adjust as a business person. Um, and generally speaking, the leasing process is pretty well understood, and there's a bunch of good outreach materials out there, some of which my colleagues and I do, but uh, a lot of other people add to that as well. Is that 15 minutes? I'm halfway through? All right, good, because I want to I wanna get through all this stuff in case there are questions and discussion. Um, this is one of the really cool tools that they, they have in Maine, and... I apologize for not doing my homework on this. It's a GIS layered map, so you can find out where aquaculture leases and LPAs are. You can find out details about how big it was, how old it is, who owns it, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can use the tools up here if you're an applicant. You can draw a line from where you think your site's gonna be to the next nearest site, and you can draw a radius around that for uh, purposes of setbacks. Uh, you can draw the polygon for your lease application. You can find eelgrass on there. You can find P90 scores. You can find all kinds of cool stuff on this. So it's a really powerful tool that the state invested in. It took them time to do this. But now it helps them do their job and it helps uh, growers understand the lay of the land as they're going through this, this uh, complicated, well, it's as complicated as it needs to be. It's not, it's not too terrible bad. But as you go through this process, this is a tool that is very helpful. Um, I'll switch gears a little bit and say that Maine, you can't swing a lobster without hitting a marine institution in Maine. Um, and we have a lot of people that do extension and research and education 
uh, and outreach. And when I say extension, I mean sort of big E, like I work for Cooperative Extension and Sea Grant, I am an extension agent. But extension is really just going to talk to people and trading information and trying to be of service to whoever it is that you're talking to. There are a lot of groups and people that do that. Um, and mostly everybody plays well together. It sometimes feels like a little bit of a crowded field now as there's so much focus on aquaculture. But the, the strong point is that everybody's got some different expertise. Um, and if I need something about seaweed, for example, I'll call up Nicole Price over at Bigelow Laboratory. And I know Nicole, we get along great, she's really good at her job. And so it's, it's actually a strength to have all this stuff and all these institutions in place. Um, now, the extension and education part, um, there's been a fair bit of attention on aquaculture extension and education, particularly in the last 10 years. And I'm gonna highlight, gonna highlight one of my own programs, our own programs here, it's Aquaculture and Shared Waters. Um, and so this is a program that we started in 2013 with two locations, the town of Korea, and in Harpswell we had five fishermen in each. Um, and the latest go-round, we've got 100 people, many of whom, if not most of whom, are coming from uh, fishing families, many of whom are women. So we have increasing diversity in our uh, new participants, and that's by design. So it feels good that, that we're making some headway there. Um, and the thing about um, the growth of aquaculture is that Micah Conkling, who just graduated from, with his PSM at University of Southern Maine, he did an analysis of who used these limited purpose aquaculture licenses, these LPAs. And it turns out most of those new growers who are in LPAs went through a training program. And we have ours, and the Island Institute has run their ABD uh, program a couple of times. Um, and so it, it makes me feel good to say, but training seems to help. And what we do in the Aquaculture and Shared Waters program is really three things. Um, we deliver technical information. People need to know where to get gear, where to buy seed, um, how the leasing process goes, how to get your product on the market, all those details. Um, and we help with that. We provide them resources so that they can learn themselves, basically get them into the pipeline, then they can understand where to go to find more information, and we network. So we have a lot of growers come in as guest speakers. We have a lot of regulators come in as guest speakers. We have people in the marketplace and gear supply, so that if I'm a new LPA holder and I don't know where to buy an oyster cage, but I saw Ryan Wood come in, I'm gonna call Ryan and say, hey Ryan, this is such and so, and I saw you talk, can I get an oyster cage? That networking turns out to be huge, and as it turns out, the networking amongst the class is also huge. Um, growers talking to growers is an essential part of this whole buzz, I think, that people are understanding about me. Um, and that's what this is about. So the Freeport Oyster Bar, um, has anybody been to Freeport or maybe been to the Oyster Bar? Yeah, all right, <laughs> yay. So this group of people, this is gonna to sound totally self-serving, but it's true, started in aquaculture and shared waters. They were some of our students. They were new growers. Some of them had a little bit of marine background. Some of them didn't. They got some information. They started to grow together in this, uh, this area of uh, northern Casco Bay. They liked each other. They hung out. Um, and now this is, a, this is an oyster bar that is owned by at least two of those. They have a co-op together as well. But really, it buys oysters from anybody around. Because the bottom line is, everybody is trying to build the sector. Yes, we're trying to build the Maine brand, and yes, Maine and Alaska, or Maine and California, and Maine and the Gulf states will compete a little bit in the marketplace, or even within Maine, there's a little bit of competition, but we're really not our competition. And if you pull back and think about how much of the US uh, seafood is imported, and how much of that seafood gets inspected or does not get inspected, and where some of that seafood is grown, you see that the US opportunity is there. It's not so much Maine or Gulf State or Alaska, and we'll, we'll all do our thing, but it's really about growing this sector, and that's where the sharing comes in. And um, here is a thing that the Maine Aquaculture Association did recently, um, and the sector is full of young people, and they do things differently than us old codgers or the people who have been in business for 20 or 30 years. 
um, and the networking and the social media and the buzz around it. And the chefs, for example, Maine is a total foodie state, believe it or not. The chefs who have come to Maine and are engaging with growers, that adds. Um, and let's see here, there are a lot of people coming to Maine specifically to farm. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. The buzz gets out and it's self-propagating. Oh man, I'm in Massachusetts, I can't get a grant. I really want to grow oysters. Been wanting to do this my whole life or I just learned about it and I want, I want my lifestyle. Where the hell can I do this? I'll go to Maine. And that is happening. Um, I think the last couple of things that I'm going to touch on here is that we focus on business. Because if you want to have a good lifestyle, you need to make a penny more than you spend. We spend a lot of time in the Aquaculture and Shared Waters program on business and business development. Um, we create tools for um, managing businesses. Lots of other support tools are out there. And if you're a grower and if you're not familiar with this or the paper version of this, then you need to be. Um, because, again, a, a business needs to thrive and survive on its own. And I'll be a little bit provocative here and say that Maine certainly has had its share of um, private and public investment come in. And that goes so well. But if you want real surviving businesses, they're going to have to wean themselves on event off eventually and survive on their own. And that's the bottom line. So if you want businesses here to survive, they need to succeed in this element of the business as well. Um, and there are a lot of support institutions around the state that help um, entrepreneurs uh, innovate with, a, with different ideas or grow their businesses. Um, and of course, we have the people. So here's Carter Newell. I know Carter's been to Alaska before. These are his submersible muscle rafts. Um, we have people like Bree Warner and Pete Ron and all the other people at um, Atlantic Sea Farms. And they've done all kinds of innovation, not only their business model, but the products that they're growing. Um, Eric Aransky and Willie Leathers, they um, heard, uh, they really hated plastic. Everybody hates plastic. It's just that it's functional and it's affordable, right? So they connected with a European company. These harvest bags are made out of beechwood, and they will compost in your compost bin in three weeks. Um, so now you don't have a polyethylene bag that gets used for approximately eight and a half minutes and goes in the trash. So um, new, new products. Uh, Marston and Bob Brewer, who I've been working with for 25 years on sea scallops. If you really want me to talk your ear off, let's talk sea scallops. You can't get in the lower 48, there's maybe one bit of the offshore fishery where you can get a whole live scallop. It doesn't exist, but these guys can do it because they're farming them. Uh, and those are some of the reasons why Maine is happening. Thanks. And I guess we have a few minutes for questions, which I'd dearly love to have if you've got and some. We are recording this, so we ask if you have a question, please come up to the microphone. Yeah, Carter, you're going to have to come back up here. So um, I'm an oyster grower in Prince William Sound. And your entry level permitting, are those commercially? viable oysters that they're, or shellfish that they're growing on those little lots? And also, what do you think you have a percentage of those that go, like, what percentage of those people or those farms go to the next level? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, the LPA, 400 square feet, is probably not commercially viable just for one, but an operator can have four to their name and can be uh, participants on f eight others. So you, you kind of smush that together. Um, and then you've got a viable operation. And there are plenty of businesses around the state that are, that are at least on their way to financial viability using LPAs. Um, and where your question comes in, I think, is that really scary point where you've, you've got your production down, you've got your operations, you've got your markets, you've got your spreadsheets, and then you've decided you have to make that leap. First of all, you have to wait for a long time to get your lease. So that's is kind of a scary time. And then there's that, that leap where you have to devote all of your time to your farm to make that scale happen. So that means you, your kind of gap financing has to be in place because 
it's going to take a while for your oysters to grow. Um, and that tends to be a place where people get pinched, um, is that hobby scale, I'm generating some income, enough for me to reinvest in the company, but I can't live off it. So then you have to make that jump. And that, that turns out to be a kind of a pinch point. All right. Thanks. I found your presentation amazing. There are so many similarities that I see and lessons we can learn, and things that we are doing that are similar. So thank you. We need to get more information from you, too. <laughs> so, OK. Right, we're going to have the, a panel, microscopic, no? No, Joss did this. Oh, Joss, when's yes. that? Sorry. That's the name. Joss. Oh, that's the name of the session. Sorry. Yes, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. <laughs> yes, well, Joth has yeah, a long history, but listed with now with Pacific Hybrid and your own shellfish farm. Right. So welcome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's see. We'll wait for that to load. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. I've, I've never actually been to Juneau. I've spent a lot of time in Alaska, but not here. It's really cool to see growers in the room. Um, I've been a shellfish grower for um, about 33 years. Um, we have a shellfish firm on North Hood Canal in Washington State. And we're waiting for my talk. Um, but uh, we, uh, we also got into kelp about six years ago. So now we're raising sugar kelp um, in, again, in North Hood Canal, different farm site. Um, and that's been super exciting. And we've done a lot of work. And that's not what I'm going to talk about this morning. But happy to talk about it as, we, um, as, as, as you wish into the meeting. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about breeding, um, if I can make this work. Um, I, uh, other than Baywater, which is the shellfish company, um, I also co-founded um, Pacific Hybrid um, with Dennis Hedgecock, a uh, University of Southern California professor about six years ago. And what we do is, hold on, direct me. Ah. There we go. Um, what we're trying to do um, with um, Pacific Hybrid, I'm going to just basically give you a, a brief overview. We're going to talk about really challenges, and this is why we started the company, um, was really how to address climate change in an era of rapid change and, 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 a, and you, focusing on shellfish and how to grow shellfish during a period where, where essentially the waters are changing. And we believe that we can, at least in part, adapt to climate change through a breeding approach. And um, we're using genetic approaches to, um, based on a process called crossbreeding to increase yield and uniformity in, in Pacific oysters currently. So this is a couple just quick slides. This is how oysters are reared in, in down in Washington State and along the west coast. Um, single or cultured oysters are grown on bottom, for example. They're also grown in suspension culture up in the upper left, which would be most similar to um, what's going on up here in Alaska, if not tray culture. Um, so different, different styles of, of shellfish aquaculture. And so the question becomes, we have a, we have a changing environment, and how is that going to impact um, growing shellfish, and not just oysters? So you can think of a, a bunch of different, a group of different stressors, hypoxia, food availability, harmful algal blooms, patch pathogens, extreme heat at low tide, changes in freshwater runoff, ocean acidification. These are all potential stressors that have, all have the potential to increase during a period of rapid climate change and in places where, um, where we are farming oysters on the west coast. Just as an example, ocean acidification. So lots been written about this, a lot of study. Um, this is the famous uh, Keeling curve graph. Um, showing atmospheric carbon dioxide increasing rapidly. It's well beyond um, 400 now, parts per million. 
What that does is it increases the solubility of carbon dioxide in seawater, which drives the levels of dissolved CO2 up, and that drives the pH down. Um, and that's what I think, my, in my view, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg here in terms of what, where ocean or coastal acidification can, is, is going to be going in the long term. So there's, there are solutions at the hatchery level, for example. Um, we know that buffering incoming seawater with calcium or sodium carbonate can greatly assist in reducing the vulnerability of oyster larvae. So that's an adaptation um, that's worked well at the hatchery level. What it does to, um, in the long term, don't know. We know that the acidification levels are going to go up on the coast over time. And so how that will impact oysters, other shellfish, is, is an area of great, great study these days. And um, in my view, I think, we're, again, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, the um, hypoxia, something probably not an issue here in Alaska, but we have a big, it's a big deal where we are. Um, we believe that hypoxia, or low dissolved oxygen, is contributing to um, mortalities in oysters, especially triploids. Um, these oysters sit in cages all day long and or in the, in the, even, in the evening and at particularly low tide when the seaweed on the, on the beaches are, is respiring, dissolved oxygen can, dry, can go way down. And that, we believe, is, can be impacting oysters. So having oysters resilient to, to, dissolve, or to, low, to hypoxia is a real priority. Um, so what we've done is, I'm not sure I have a pointer or not, we have dissolved oxygen meters here and here, off bottom, on bottom, to measure these things. So we're doing that now to see what the actual impacts are. Um, Let's see. Um, extreme heat at low tide, as most of you know, we had a heat dome here um, in the Pacific Northwest several years ago, where we actually saw um, in June of 2021, uh, we measured a temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit on our beach, OK? That resulted in significant mortalities of oysters, especially native clams and native mussels. Um, and this was all written up um, through, with a Washington Sea Grant publication recently. So it's a big deal. Heat, heat dome events are new. Um, haven't had those. And so again, um, climate is, is the, seems to me at least to be the culprit here. So we decided, um, Dennis Hedgecock, Hedgecock and I just decided to form a breeding company. We're utilizing a, a approach called crossbreeding to in, basically increase resiliency and um, and what we, other, what we believe are other traits that are important to growers. And now, as I stated earlier, I'm a grower. I really care about, I've been on the tide flats for 30 plus years, and I really, it's really important to me. The opening photograph was my son um, operating the farm, and it's, uh, we are now second generation. It's really, really important that there's a resource for them, for him and his family, to be able to have the advantages that I did um, growing oysters. So we're using. We're using an approach that I'm showing a slide of corn. That seems crazy. But actually, the, the underpinnings of, of, of hybrid vigor were all established with corn many, many years ago. And so basically, the idea here is that um, crosses of, of corn, these are inbred lines of, of the same species. When you cross them, you see this phenomenon called hybrid vigor, where the V by A and the A by B outperform either inbred line. And believe it or not, this approach works with oysters. Um, and the, it's often, and I want to just quickly um, um, compare it to selection programs, which is the other approach for improving um, stock traits in animals and plants. But the issue for, for me, for us, in our, in our belief is that um, selection is based on basically breeding the, the, the high performance for a given trait and breeding those to, to create more of that, of that particular um, line over time. So you are continually breeding the, the, the better performance, performance to get where you want to get, get go. Crossbreeding is different. Crossbreeding, you create inbred lines, OK? And I'm going to go through that very briefly. And then when you cross particular inbred lines together, you, get what, you can get a phenomenon called hybrid vigor, where the mean of the of the hybrid is higher than either mean of um, the, the parent inbred lines. And uh, this will hopefully make some more sense in a moment. So the problem with selection can be that it's limited to the number of traits that you can actually select for. 
And, and if you focus on one trait and you don't bring in new animals, which reduces your selection potential, it can lead to inbreeding. inbreeding. Whereas in the case of crossbreeding, you can actually evaluate multiple traits on, on a tide flat, for example, at the same, same time. But it, it absolutely requires having a great many lines to evaluate at any given time. So that's the focus of Pacific hybrid. We're, we're trying to generate a lot of different lines. And the reason for heterosis is this is work um, that Donald Manahan's lab down at the University of Southern California is focused on. Basically, um, in, in larvae at least, we know that hybrid larvae are just better feeders than inbred, inbred lines. So there's a, there's a mechanism for why um, the heterosis is actually occurring in, in Pacific oysters. So we started um, a laboratory um, hatchery. This is in Kona, Hawaii here. Um, we, we operate out of shipping containers um, at Nelha, just near, near the airport in Kona. And what we're trying to do, we have a full-on um, hatchery um, laboratory facility where we have capacity right now for growing 50 separate lines of, of genetically distinct Pacific oysters or other shellfish. We have the algae to feed them, and we have the mother nature to provide a lot of sunshine um, for a lot of the, most of the food that we will need to, do, to, to uh, have to, to be able to um, generate what we're doing. Um, so that's super important. Um, very briefly, um, what we have is a pipeline of crosses that we will, we will do annually. Um, what we, we create different, basically different pipelines of lines. G zeros are these wild male by wild female lines. We actually raised them up. They were reproductive. We made a mother, a brother with a sister. That forms what we call an inbred line. And then we made all the inbred lines. This is the, this is the mechanism. This is the, this is the duty. This is what we do as a company is we mate then full factorial combinations of every possible hybrid combination. This diagonal in yellow, I think I circled it, are all second generation inbred lines. But these guys here, all the ones in white, these are the possible, possible lines that could do very well on your tide flat if you're raising oysters or, or in the water. And so those are the ones we wish to really focus on and test. And then once we find good lines, we will then make, take two, the two best hybrids and make hybrid by hybrid tests for, um, for double hybrid production. Okay, very briefly, um, the corn, thousands, thousands of hybrid lines are tested annually. We're right now focused on aspirationally hundreds of hybrid lines um, focused. This is a, a picture of our beach in last summer. What you get out of it though is cool. So these are, um, this was a, some work we did years ago comparing wild to a hybrid line. Hybrids were about 40% um, larger after just one generation, super easy. Um, also, it's important to notice that reciprocals um, are different. 47 by 35 just is a line. It's a, it's a male by female combination. When you look at the alternate or the 35 by 47, you see the, the 35 by 47 is much bigger. So it matters which direction the cross actually goes. So these are just little, little pieces. And then this is, a, this is a, the summary graphic, really. Additive genetic variation is what selection is based on. Non-additive is what crossbreeding is based on. And what we're trying to do is get the best of both. We, got, we use selection, but also the non-additive crossbreeding <clears throat> to identify is this yield on this graph here, and that axis. We're looking for lines that do really well up in that part of the graph. And that's the whole angle that we have. So our goals, um, we, are, we are essentially a field testing company. We want to look at multiple genetic lines in, a different, in different environments. We want to look basically to try to produce seed lots <coughs> that are resilient to a changing climate. We're working in Baja, Mexico. We're working in Central California, Pacific Northwest, of course. We're in, in Southeast Alaska, we've been working with Eric um, with some, some initial seed groups that he's been evaluating on his farm. Um, basically, we're, we want to provide a, a place where pain points for growers can be hopefully resolved, at least through genetics in part. So our focus is decreased mortality, essentially, in diploid and triploid oysters where they're grown. Increased rate of growth. Not always, a, not as, in many places, it's not, that, um, it's not that big a deal to have oysters that grow relatively slowly. I think Alaska would be probably a pretty high, um, possibly a, an important point here would be to have faster growing oysters, right? 
What we're finding actually amongst the industry, and this is reflective of my long time with growing oysters, is that actually what we see in hybrids is that there's increased uniformity within a seed cohort. So that seems really important to growers where you're having to grade and, and handle and bring back the ones that are too small, come back and forth. So that's, that's a huge point for us. And so that's something we're really, really focused on. So again, we're using this um, as a way of looking at the different possibilities that, that are going to be impacting shellfish over the, over the long term and basically looking at the importance of multi-stressor field experiments where you look at not only low oxygen, but you might look at low oxygen temperature together in synergy. How is that impacting oysters? Because after all, that's what's going to be hitting, um, hitting us as climate change unfolds. Um, and so uh, other strategies, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're growing seaweeds. Um, we're combining, we have a uh, New Zealand flip farm um, program in Northwood Canal where we're growing oysters in suspended culture. So there's a lot of different strategies. Um, happy to talk more about our seaweed work um, when, uh, if, you, if you wish to. And um, thank you so much for your attention. <clears throat> Questions? Yeah. Hi. Eric. I have a question. I, I just wanted to point out, you said uh, uniformity yes. is a trait. Yes. And I know you were talking about, I, I'm cop in my mind, I view it as a very um, compact growth curve. Correct. That means we try to get almost all of them are coming through in a batch instead Correct. of this trailed out over months and years, which is, you know, sometimes typical. Yes. But there is another thing that I really noticed too, and that's uniformity in that shape. Mm -hmm. You see all these different conformations of shape. Yes. And I mean, from the same hatchery right. or hatcheries, over years, there'll be different ones. It's different families. And sometimes they're really nice to begin with, and all you got to do is keep from wrecking that. Mm -hmm. So, and other times it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's a, something to be looked at too. Yeah. It, it makes it easier for us and easier you know, to market a great yeah. product if it's kind of baked in to begin with. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. we're a data-driven data company and um, one of the things that we look at will, are, is within each line, how, how, tight, sorry, how tight is that that's, um, yeah. uniformity from the smallest to the largest? Because as a, as again, as a grower, I know it, it, it's not great when you have a lot of variation in your, in your cohort that you're bringing out cages mm -hmm. and never harvesting as many as you want out of every given cage. It comes down to the bottom line, and I just reflect on what Dana, Dana was talking about. You know, it is all about running a business, and those, those things matter. So um, that's, that's one of our main breeding goals, actually, is, how to, is lines that have increased uniformity. They may not even be the fastest growers. Um, we hope they survive well, but uniformity is a big deal. Yes, Paul Foose, and I really appreciate your work. You. I just uh, wonder, is there any risk of this uh, being called like a genetically modified organism? It's obviously like a Franken oyster or something <laughs> like that. And uh, the other thing, I, it wasn't clear, can these hybrids continue to propagate, or are they like a mule? They can't, could they be used as brood stock for further propagation? Good, Thank great, you. great questions. We know um, they are not GMOs in any sense of the word. Um, they are using the natural variability within the oyster to produce, just basically using genetics as genetics has been used in crops and animal husbandry for thousands of years. It's just simply speeding up the process. And the other, the other factor, so no, no GMOs involved here. It's all a natural process, really, of just basically facilitating the, um, the, the rate of change within a, within, within a Pacific oyster. And the other question, help me. Uh, oh, yeah, brood, brood stock, yes. Um, what, what would happen is we produce brood, brood lines. Those would be made available. You use those, you can use those year after year after year to produce seed cohorts as long as the oysters live. Um, what, you, what doesn't work is you can't use the offspring 
of the oyster to produce more. It's just the way, because it, they, they're, they're called F2 hybrids, they don't, they don't perform the way that a, that a single hybrid would perform. So um, yes on the broodstock, as long as the oysters are alive, they're available to, to re reproduce and re retrace what you've already done. Um, our goal is to be always producing better broodstock every year. Um, and th so, but there is, a, um, there is a limitation on using the offspring that you're trying to grow for your product as broodstock. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Paul, I think the word that I would like to use that refers to this is in their name, Pacific Hybrid. It's breeding. It's just informed breeding that's been done for you know thousands of years in animal husbandry. So next, Brianna. I'm sorry. Are you here? Brianna Murphy? Yes. Oh, there you are. So a couple of years ago, you reached out to, to me. Come on up. With and yeah, have an interesting project. Still in Seward, right? Um, sort of. We're mobile. Started in Seward. We'll get into that. Yeah. On a saner. On a tender. Tender. Tender vessel. Let's yeah. tell us about it. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. I will. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very flattered to be here, very flattered to be part of this illustrious lineup. Um, my name is Brianna Murphy, and I'm a co-founder of Fisherman Fresh, which is a mobile seaweed hatchery based throughout South Central Alaska, primarily in Seward, although we operated in Valdez this last year. Um, my business partner and I are both humble commercial fishermen. I'm just going to turn those down a little bit. So not formally trained biologists, but we've been really excited to play in the hatchery space for the last couple years now, and we wanted to share some of our experiences. So just to provide a bit of context about where we're coming from, uh, Kristen and I are both originally commercial fishermen. We met through commercial fishing. I grew up fishing with my family outside of Whittier. Kristen has been running saners and other boats throughout Alaska since 2008. And that dependence on the ocean for our livelihoods was what first triggered our interest in seaweed farming. I imagine that's the case for a lot of people here. Uh, and so in 2000, in spring of 2020, we decided to invest our time and resources in the long-term health of the oceans, and we founded Fisherman Fresh as uh, originally just intending to farm kelp. But while we were waiting for approval for our farm site, there were several major industry bottlenecks that became apparent to us. I'm sure everybody here is also familiar with those hurdles. But one of the biggest hurdles involved hatcheries. So when we applied for our farm in 2020, there were only three licensed hatcheries in Alaska to support 30 permitted farms, and there were an additional 25 farms in the permitting pipeline. And so the disparity between hatcheries and farmers and interested farmers was obviously aggravated by Alaska's strict collection regulations, which require really close relationships between hatcheries and farmers. And so as we learned more about the industry and about the 50-50 rule, it became clear to us that scaling up for farms, specifically in the South Central region, was going to be difficult if sores tissue and seeded string had to be shipped and flown all around the region. So these sort of limiting logistics around moving seeded, to, uh, seeded string and sorus tissue were the catalyst behind our mobile hatchery design. And in spring of 2021, we received our permit to start a kelp hatchery. And that same spring, we received a specialty crop block grant from the USDA to build out a mobile facility. Mobile in the sense that we placed it on the back deck of one of Kristen's many salmon tenders. You can see it looming over us there when we were first setting it up in fall of 2021. So the idea behind the mobile aspect of the hatchery was that we could move from farm site to farm site, either collecting source tissue ourselves or receiving it from farmers and then processing it immediately on board the vessel. And likewise with seeded string, issues like cargo getting bumped from flights, which happened to us our first year, unfortunately, and having to do large orders of seeded string, large, uh, multiple shipments of seeded string, um, 
could be overcome by just delivering it to farmers at their farm sites. And that way the kelp could also be kept safe in their tanks until conditions were appropriate for a successful outplanting. So when uh, grow out quantities become large enough that a move like this makes sense, this will definitely be a service that we will be happy to provide. But right now we're mobile in the sense that we can base our hatchery production from anywhere along the coast. So, so far in 2021, we based our hatchery location in Seward. And in 2022, we moved over to Valdez so that we could collaborate with the Prince William Sound College there and incorporate an intern into our 2022 growth cycle. So our goal coming into this was to test assumptions and parameters that would make growing kelp as available as possible to folks in rural communities. And our design was a combination of easy, easily reproducible practices with labor and energy conscious inputs. And our operating motto is taken from the epic Jurassic Park fr franchise, nature will find a way. So during our first grow season in fall of 2021, we grew a little over 8,000 feet of seeded string for a new farmer. And you can see a rack of our bull kelp here. And here are some photos of our bull kelp saurus tissue. You can see that we were really lucky to start with some very fertile stuff. So um, that was very helpful. We've been lucky to get great samples both years. And here are some examples of how quickly kelp can grow at the hatchery stage. The first two weeks or so after, uh, after inoculation, our, the spools are completely bare, which gave me a lot of anxiety during our first growing season. Uh, you can see growth under the microscope, but it's hard to get a sense of how even or well distributed the spools are going to end up being. So just a couple weeks later, really just 10 days, you can start to see pretty even discoloration on the spools, and it starts to look like a light layer of fuzz. And here are some pictures as we were shipping them out. You can see the whole process from inoculation to shipment during our first year it took just under 50 days. I think it was 40 days on our second season. So the biggest, uh, when we were first starting out and developing the hatchery, uh, some of the key considerations that were very kindly pointed out to us as the biggest roadblocks to economical hatchery production were capital construction costs and labor and operating costs. So we wanted to design a hatchery that was based around our strengths, and we wanted to basically see what efficiencies we could put in place and still have good results. So a couple of key consideration of considerations of propagating kelp at the hatchery level are temperature regulation and sanitation and um, providing nutrients to the tanks and doing tank changes. And those last two are obviously the more labor-intensive aspects of operating a hatchery. So the biggest consideration, and especially the most concerning one for us, was sanitation. Keeping the seawater clean, sterilizing lab equipment and tanks after tank changes, and just keeping contamination in check. And I was definitely really worried about this going into our first growing season, because even a really, really clean fishing vessel is still a work boat. Um, but uh, there are some also, also some really useful manuals that are available online for setting up and operating hatcheries. And some of their uh, recommendations for keeping sanitation in check was um, not exposing the hatchery to open air, to outside air, and not wearing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not wearing clothes that have been exposed to seawater um, in the hatchery. So obviously we tried to be careful, but we didn't really implement any practices that were outside functional capability, and we haven't actually had any issues with contamination so far in our two years. So our first year, we pulled our uh, seawater directly from our fish hold. And to sterilize the seawater, we just had three sediment filters in line with a UV sterilizer. The sediment filters sterilized our water down to 0.35 microns. And then the UV sterilizer just ensured that everything going into the tanks was fully clean. Um, the UV sterilizers, we do the same for the effluent as well. But the UV sterilizers were definitely our biggest single expenditures going into it. But obviously worth it to make sure that you're starting with clean water. So in addition to being able to provide various communities with access to a hatchery facility, uh, we were also able to gain experience operating a hatchery in a completely new area this year, which was not the same as the previous year. Uh, we had a really shocking amount of rain in the Prince William Sound area this year, pretty much from July until the uh, started snowing in November. And so all that influence in freshwater runoff meant that we had to pull our water from about 15 feet below the surface of the water, whereas the previous year we'd pulled our water from just five feet below the water surface. 
So because of that lack of salinity, we ended up pulling our water directly from the harbor during our second year, which gave us a chance to evaluate if there was any problem using water that would potentially be more contaminated. And luckily, we didn't run into any issues with contamination from that either. It just clogged up our sediment filters slightly faster than it had the prior year. And to sterilize our lab equipment and wash our tanks, we just used a combination of bleach, hot water, and isopropyl alcohol, not all at the same time. Uh, but we didn't have access to an autoclaver or anything, and those materials proved to be sufficient. Um, for temperature regulation, we chose to regulate the air temperature, which was something that we could do more cost-effectively and easier than regulating the water temperature. Um, since the Connex is insulated, the air temperature doesn't fluctuate too wildly anyway. And during our first year, our sophisticated and very cost-effective method of controlling the air temperature was just a space heater that I would plug in on cold nights, and then I would just open up the door to the hatchery if it got too hot during the day. Um, our second year, we kind of wanted to test how wide of a temperature range um, we could let the air temperature swing to, and so we let it get as high as 66 degrees with no adverse reactions. Um, we also set up these um, automated Bluetooth-controlled space heaters and thermometers. So that was nice to be able to control the temperature from a distance and be able to check on the temperature of the hatchery without physically being in there. And it also kept this nice, neat log, so there was just one less thing for the hatchery manager to record in the notes. Uh, we've also tried a variety of different nutrient combinations, and after two years, we weren't really able to tell any discernible difference in... Um, in either how quickly or how well the kelp grew. But again, we weren't really running these experiments in a very controlled lab setting, more just kind of testing to see what efficiencies we could put in place um, and seeing either if we could get the kelp out more quickly and lower operating costs that way or lower costs in labor and materials. So even though there wasn't a huge discernible difference in growth, one material, one uh, standard fertilizer that we used was significantly cheaper than the F over two that's really commonly used although it does require mixing into a solution beforehand, whereas the F over two, you can just add immediately to the tanks. So here are some photos of our second year growing period. It's uh, not too interesting because they look a lot like the first year, so it does make for a great slideshow, but it was very exciting for us to be able to replicate our results. And you can see it was just 40 days for our last, um, for this growing season from inoculation until we were shipping them out. And we ended up with a couple really nice, even, evenly grown spools there. So our time spent operating in Valdez this year offered some insights into logistical considerations. Uh, Raven Air and Alaska Airlines recently ended their partnership, which made shipping anything into Valdez uh, very difficult. So working with non-Valdez-based farms was um, kind of a horrific process, actually, because I ended up having to drive up to Anchorage and pick up the source tissue and then drive five hours down to Valdez and process it immediately, which is kind of an unreasonable expectation in terms of scaling up and also in a perfect world is something we would never do again. But uh, <laughs> that experience really served to solidify uh, the importance of hatcheries being lo located close to the farm sites that they serve. So in that vein, we're currently in the process of applying for additional hatchery permits so that we can develop and operate these mobile hatcheries throughout ports across South Central Alaska. Some of the benefits to operating a mobile hatchery facility we've found include ease of permitting regulations since it's not a land-based facility so you don't have to do a joint application and involve DNR. Um, consistent and easy access to seawater as well as easy disposal process for any effluent water and also um, uh, being able to make use of a seasonal facility, both by using something that typically goes unused throughout the fall and winter, and also by not having to maintain a facility year-round if it's only going to be used for a portion of the year to propagate kelp. So hopefully this hatchery season, we're going to end up having multiple hatcheries active in different ports where communities can gain hands-on experience with operating hatcheries and avoid some of the logistical dif difficulties of moving sensitive materials around our coastal communities in the unpredictable weather of our fall and winter. So I'll leave this last page up here with our contact information. Um, and please feel free to copy it down and get in touch. We're very interested in collaborating with other farmers or also um, collaborating with anybody who has interest in learning more about the hatchery side of things. Uh, also, just a quick note on our name. I know I've said Fisherman Fresh throughout this proposal, but we're in an awkward in-between stage of changing um, 
of shifting over to Mothers of Millions, so that will be the name that we use going forward, and that's the contact information that we have currently. Great talk. Um, I'm curious about sort of the energy input that you have to have to put it on your tender. Um, like, do you feel like there's any benefits of having something land-based that might be connected to the grid or that those electricity costs are so high that that's not a significant thing? And have you looked into any other ways of powering the tender? Great question. Uh, Actually, something that we're looking at doing this year is um, we want to set up a battery bank and solar panels so that we can run it all off a 12-volt system. Um, the boat was hooked up to shore power, so it's, we weren't running a generator or anything. Um, and it, the whole hatchery ran off just one breaker, so setting it up on a 12-volt system wouldn't be uh, difficult at all, and that's something that we plan to do going forward just to make it totally energy independent. Uh, thank you. If there are no more questions. <laughs> okay. Hi again. One of the, I guess, concepts that Brianna and her partner were exploring is, uh, you know, season out, using, having a facility. Yep right, that's used for a season and used for something else for a season, and that's one of the things that we are doing at Oceans Alaska, too, um, which is unique. So how does this work? Help. Oh, right now. Oh, shit. Nine forty. Break until ten. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs> 